Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. I travel across the world and almost every place that I go to, there are some devotees from Pune who are there. And uh, now, of course, with Adishampru preaching in the West, it's like the whole world has become the Vishwarup expanding from Pune. <laughs> and even the places where there are no devotees from here, there is inspiration from here which goes there and the devotees, especially in terms of youth outreach, is, uh, it's extraordinary what has happened in India, what is happening in various parts of the world. So I have been going to America for 10 years, so I feel that you know, my outreach there is like a small canoe, just making some waves. Radeshampru has come with a battalion. <laughs> and with many boats associated with it and it's creating not just waves but a storm, wonderful storm of course. So I'm grateful to be here to be of some service. So today I'll speak on the topic of sacrifice. Here in this particular pastime the Devtas have just offered prayers to the Lord, the Lord has responded and he's concluding by saying that your problem of how to overcome Ritrasur, that will be dealt with by a very extraordinary means. And that is, he's saying, go to the Dijimuni and ask for his body. Now the Bhagavatam focuses generally on principles. It does not get into technicalities. How exactly, you know, what was the process used by which the Dichi's body was used to make a weapon? That's not the focus of the Bhagavatam. Hmm? What was the technology used, you know? <laughs> the focus of the Bhagavatam is not on techniques, it's on values. Hmm? While techniques are described at times, but its focus is on values. So we'll focus on the value of sacrifice. I'll talk, I'll use this as a whiteboard for writing. I'll talk in terms of five points. And so we'll talk about first, how the Lord works, how the Lord works in the world and why sacrifice is needed, especially when he's working in the world. Then we'll talk about what love devotion means and how that is related with sacrifice. Then I'll talk about the specific sacrifice of life, which is what is described over here. Then I'll talk about a sacrifice bigger than that or a sacrifice, you could say bigger or tougher than that. Tougher than that is sacrifice of life. And the last point is, I'll talk about sacrifice we can do now. What can we do? So let's begin. Here the Lord's ways of working are extraordinary. It's not only that he has been asked for help, but it's, it's on some occasion the Lord says, I will descend and I'll help you. Like he comes as the avatars, Krishna, Ram and others. Sometimes he tells, and even when he comes as Krishna and Rama, he doesn't just say to the devatas, okay, I'll come and solve the whole problem. He says, no, you have to participate. So the devatas have to become Vanara, say, or Ram's Leela. So similarly, the, whenever the Lord descends, He, in one sense, does not work alone. He can do everything Himself. But that is not the focus of how the Lord works in the world. Krishna tells Arjuna, Dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. I come to establish Dharma. And yet, Krishna has taken a vow to not raise a weapon in the biggest war for establishing dharma. So, why is that? That if his mission is to establish dharma, why is it that he is not taking up weapons to establish dharma? Well, he does kill many demons, but in general, the Lord's purpose is not just that he fixes the problems. He wants souls to take up responsibility 
And Sri Prabhupada says in a lecture that after hearing the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna shows the universal form, and the universal form, he says that, how all the warriors are being destroyed. Arjuna doesn't say, Krishna, in any way you are going to destroy all the warriors. You just destroy them. I will sit and watch. Prabhupada goes for this. says, I will sit and take bhang. <laughs> so, so, in general, how the Lord works in this world, you know, he can work directly, swair, as the word is used in the Bhagavatam, swair and dorbhir, through others. So, most of the time, the Lord prefers to work through others. Through others means through those souls who are his devotees or who become his devotees. Now, when he works indirectly, broadly, there are two ways. Indirectly is souls he sends to the world. Hmm? And that is those who are directly coming from the spiritual world. So, for example, Prahlad Maharaj, at least as he's explained in the Bhagavatam, he says that you, a Lord, have sent me to this world to demonstrate the principles of devotional service. But then, souls, he empowers based on their service, their dedication. So, if a soul desires to take responsibility, the Lord empowers those souls also. And if we see at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. the last verse is Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanurdhara Tatra Shri Vijayo Bhutir Dhruvani Tir Matir Mama. So now it's saying wherever there is Krishna, there is, and Arjuna, there is, there is power, there is victory, there is extraordinary opulence. So Shri is Lakshmi Devi. Now, Shri is always there where Vishnu is there. So, why does Arjuna have to be mentioned over there? Isn't it? That where Krishna is, there will be victory. So, why is it mentioned that where Krishna and Arjuna are there, there will be victory over there? See, the purpose of the Gita, or we can say Krishna's purpose, is not so much to establish his position or proclaim his position that is there no doubt but that is a prime that is not the primary purpose it is more to transform it is not to proclaim god's position but it is to transform man's disposition it is so the point of telling in the last word yatra partho dhanurdhara is that Ar that is God's plan is going to work. No doubt, God is supreme. But Arjuna has become inspired to play his part in God's plan. So generally the Lord works through his instruments, through his devotees. And that is, there are many reasons for this. He gives us the devotees opportunities to become purified. He gives, he wants, because of his love, he wants the devotees to take credit, to get the credit. But the point is, generally the Lord works through his devotees. And for those devotees to become the Lord's instruments, those devotees, those souls have to be ready to sacrifice, have to be ready to take responsibility. That's why the idea is not in the Vedic tradition, although generally religious traditions are of two kinds. Of course, this kind of classification is based on uh, Western modes of analysis, but we can place the Vedic framework within that. So one is what is called as messianic. Messianic means some messiah is going to come. Some deliverer is going to come in the future and that person will bring heaven on the earth. That person will solve all problems. So the idea is wait for something wonderful in the future. That something wonderful. The other kind of tradition is apocalyptic. Apocalyptic means the future, everything is going to be destroyed. Only those who surrender to God, they will be saved. So the idea is the future is wonderful, have faith and continue on. The future is dreadful, take shelter right now. So these are broadly two ways. See, in general, we humans function by those two things hope 
and fear. Hmm? The two primary, Ichha and Bhaya, Krishna talks about it. So, that hope that the future can be better. And that's why we work hard. We may say we may try to get a better house, we may try to do this, we may try to do that. But, say a couple gets married, they hope that we have nice children, they'll become wonderful people. That's what makes them work hard. And there's fear. Oh, when I go old, who will take care of me? And maybe I need to have some savings. I need to have this, I have that. So hope and fear are these fundamental human psychological drives. And the religious traditions generally tap these two drives. That the, so the hope is tapped through the messianic tradition. And the fear is tapped through the apocalyptic tradition. Now, if we consider the Vedic tradition has both these elements, but it's much more than that. That yes, there is the messianic tradition is there when we have the idea of avatars and we have the, say even the Shakti Avish avatars, there are great souls who come. But, and there's also the apocalyptic tradition that there is a dark age, Kali Yuga is going to come. But if we see Srila Prabhupada's preaching, Srila Prabhupada was not apocalyptic. There are the 12th canto, the 11th, the, in the Bhagavatam, in the 12th canto, there's a lot of talk about the dark symptoms of Kali Yuga. But it's not that Prabhupada has given hundreds of lectures on that. No, Prabhupada is not so focused on that. Prabhupada hardly ever talks about the 5th canto hellish descriptions. You know, he doesn't say that, you, you stop doing sense gratification because that will take you to hell. His focus is stop sense gratification because that is not the worthy way to live. Your life is meant for so much more. You can have so much more happiness. So Prabhupada is appealing generally to the intelligence. And Prabhupada had, you know, Prabhupada in one sense, in our tradition, he, we consider him to be the Messiah. He's a Shakti Avish Avatar. But at the same time, Prabhupada did not encourage an ethos that everybody should depend on him, he is going to save them. He encouraged everyone to take responsibility. He encouraged everyone to, to actually share Krishna consciousness with others. So in one sense, the, the Vedic tradition is more than this. The idea that whether the future is dreadful or the future is wonderful, the important thing is what we are doing in the present. Are we taking responsibility for raising our consciousness in the present? That is much more important. And so here the point I'm making is, that the Lord acts through, the, through individuals in the world and that's the emphasis of the broad Vedic tradition. Not so much what the nature of the future is going to be, but what we are going to do. So in general, when we talk about love or devotion, love is seen in through two ways. One is what we give to the object of love. Hmm? What we give to the beloved. And the second is what we give up for the beloved. Hmm? What we give and what we give up. So for example, if you can, I've been spending a lot of time in America. In America, it's the country of immigrants. There are lots of, uh, lots of countries people have come. Among all the immigrants, Indians are the most successful. So Indians are, and there are many, there's a lot of sociological analysis done about why Indians are so successful. Now the, the parameters of success may be material, but they're also important. Now Indians are the wealthiest, Indian children are the most well-educated, Indians have the least divorce rates, Indians have the least uh, criminal delinquency, Indians have the least drug, drug, drug usage and addictions. So on many parameters. And one of the things that uh, American sociologists have found is that it is because of Indian parenting. Because Indian parents prioritize their children. They are ready to give the best for their children. They are ready to, Indian mothers may postpone their careers, their career growth, so that they can, they are there for the children. Indian fathers will take up jobs, even if those are less paying, so that they can give their children the best education, where the best school is. So because of this, the success, children grow up and children are successful. So love, that is the love of the parents. What you give to the parent, children, you give the best education, even if it's expensive. What you give up, now okay, we may give up one's own comforts, we may take a loan. So this is the, this is the broad characteristic of love. Shri Prabhupada also says in the Nectar of Instruction, 
that uh, that devotional service is not sentimental speculation or imaginative ecstasy. So its substance is practical activity. So practical activity means what? When if we have devotion for the Lord, then what are we doing for the Lord? What are we giving to the Lord and what are we giving up for the Lord? So in one sense, when we take initiation, we we chant japa, we take the vow to take, do japa, that is what we are giving to the Lord is, we are giving our consciousness to the Lord. And every day for this much time, my dear Lord, I'll offer my consciousness to you. And what we give up, we give up certain pleasures of the world, the four regulatory principles. So that is like a basic expression of love. What we give and what we give up. And in general, a serious relationship involves both of these. There are many people who are religious and they, now any Krishna says Chaturvidha Bhajante Maam Jana Sukrutino, whoever comes to him for whatever reason, he says he is appreciative of them, they are Sukrutina. But in general if you consider on the graph of religious people, if you cross the world, now there are many people who are ready to give to the Lord. Hmm? People will give charity and of course they are laudable if somebody gives charity. But giving to the Lord is actually relatively easy. Giving up for the Lord is much more difficult. So for example somebody may have, I was in New Zealand and there was one devotee I met. I have been going there for a few years. So there was a devotee, he, he, he had a, one of the biggest hotel chains in New Zealand. And he, his, his parents, his family is always very pious. They had some worship of Krishna and they would give charity. But when they were introduced to devotees, one of the first things that devotees told them, there were some, they were going to some priests before, uh, you know, now, and they were doing some rituals. When they were introduced to devotees, devotees, he said, the first time somebody told me that, you know, if I really want to be a Krishna Bhakta, I should not be serving meat in my restaurants. He said, nobody told me that. Because, he said, now he, he, this was his reading, he said, those priests were afraid that if I tell them, give up meat or give up serving meat, they said, we will give those priests up. But he said, the devotees were. I said, you know, this is important. So they were giving charity to the Lord, but to tell them that you, know, you should do something. Now, of course, so that devotee is spiritual master, and I know him very well. So he said that, I, I've been going to New Zealand for about for, for 10 years, 7, 8 years. So I talked with his spiritual master. I know this devotee also very well. So we, we all had three way we had a talk. So he had like a chain of 50 restaurants and not just his family. He has got himself, but he has got almost like 150 family members. And he said, I may have become a serious devotee. I can't jeopardize their future. But at the same time, I want to give this. I want to start this. So he talked with his extended family, he had a meeting and we told him, we talked with him and he suggested that. He said that, you know, I will start one hotel as a test experiment. That I will have no meat in it and let's see how it goes. If it goes well, then we will change all the other. It was a big risk for him. Mm. But then somehow Krishna has his ways of working. See, that is the time when in the West, the vegan culture started becoming more and more prominent. <laughs> so, in India, people think to become modern, to become cool means to start eating meat. But in the West, people think to become cool is to stop eating meat. So, so he styled his restaurant as New Zealand's first vegan restaurant. <laughs> and although it was a risky move, it worked. And so it, still it took him six years to actually change his entire restaurant chain to make it serving only vegetarian food. It took time. Mm -hmm. So, it took time, but the idea is that devotion is seen not just by what we give to the Lord, but what we also give up for the Lord. And of course, the highest would be we give and give up. We give something and we give up something both. That is not easy. Hmm? We see Srila Prabhupada, when he came to India, 
There are a lot of people who became life members, and they were very supportive uh, in many ways. But the level of dedication that is required to become an initiated follower of Prabhupada, you know, they, they were pious, but there is piety and there is spirituality. Spirituality requires a significant more dedication. So Prabhupada appreciated them where they were, but it was difficult for them to have that level of dedication. So love is seen by what we give for the Lord and what we give up for the Lord. So that's the second point. And the third point is that among the things that we may give up for the Lord, one of the greatest is the sacrifice of life. And that is what is being asked over here. And now this idea of sacrificing one's life, it's, it's an extraordinary idea. In the Christian tradition, God asks one of the prophets, that you should sacrifice your son for me. And you know, there is a lot of that. Now he, he is actually has to sacrifice his son and raises his hand. And that time God says, stop. I was only testing you. Hmm? I was testing you and you passed the test. But how could God ask someone to do something like this? This idea of sacrifice. So in the, in the biblical tradition, there is elaborate analysis of this. And the idea is that God can make great demands. And how the normal idea is that God is our protector. People pray to God so that their life will be protected, their health will be protected, their wealth will be protected. And what is the God who is asking to end your life? You know, it is almost the inversion of the normal conception of God. So it's almost becoming like, you know, God is the protector. But here God is becoming the destroyer. So how does this work? What kind of God would ask for this? So the, that incident, it's, it's sometimes in a movie, there are various scenes. And some scenes, some action scenes or some dialogues are such that they are called showstoppers. It's, you know, like people just want to replay it again. What, what happened? How did this happen? So, so some, some, so some things are showstoppers. So in, in the Bible, biblical tradition, this comes in the Old Testament, not the Jew, Jewish, the Christian Bible, it's the Hebrew Bible. But there, the idea of God asking someone to sacrifice their life, it's a showstopper. Now in the Bhagavatam, this is almost like a side show. <laughs> Isn't it? It's not that. There is a lot of discussion on this. Yeah, the Lord asks. And Daddiji Muni plays around a little bit. He says, how can I sacrifice my life? And I said, no, no, you should do this. <laughs> See, Indra is not ready to, Prabhupada points in his purport, how Indra is so attached to his body. So Indra is not ready to sacrifice his kingdom, but he says, dharma means you should sacrifice. You should sacrifice your body for others. And Daddiji Muni says, yes, I, I'm already ready, ready to do that. And I just wanted to hear some good words of wisdom from you. So... <laughs> But the point is that there's no big you and cry about it. There are a few verses which talk about how glorious Dadichi is. But it is, it is almost like when in a movie there's a plot. And within the plot, there is a subplot. So the main plot is going in a particular direction. But for the, if you want to go from here to here, then you have to go slightly off. Sometimes you are fighting an enemy, but to fight an enemy you need a weapon. And then, to get the weapon, you have to go and fight some other enemy. Or you have to do something else. So if this is the main plot, and this is the subplot or a side plot. So the whole story of Dadichi is just a subplot over here. Isn't it? It is just the key story is what happens, how the devatas fight with Indra fights with Uttarasur. So the point is, this is just a side show in the Bhagavatam. Why is that? Because the Bhagavatam is talking about a very high level of devotion. <laughs> Dharma projahita kaitavotra paramo nirmatsaranam satam. That, that dharma where we expect God to do favors to us. That dharma where God is like our facilitator, our protector. See, the idea is Krishna is telling us that I am performing pastimes in the spiritual world. Come and join me. That is the Bhagavatam. That is the ultimate purpose of the Bhagavad Gita. But often mundane dharma is, oh God, I want to perform pastimes here. You come and help me. <laughs> you know, 
I want to become powerful. I want to become wealthy. I want to do this. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. So God, come and help me. So I, I was once uh, flying somewhere in India. So I saw somebody reading a newspaper, and there was a cricket match report, and he says, "God, I kn- I knew that God was going to answer my prayer." So I said, "What happened? What was, what was it about?" So apparently there was uh, some cricket match, and it was. Uh, this batsman this is many years ago maybe 7 8 years ago so this batsman was batting very well and in the, at that time in one day matches scoring a double century was quite rare so this batsman he was on his way to score a double century and somehow while batting he just missed hit a ball and that ball went high end. and it was a match against i think west indies so it was one of the most most reliable fielders it was a very easy catch and this batsman he said i was praying to god let him drop this catch <laughs> and then he said he dropped the catch so i knew god had answered my prayer <laughs> he said i knew that god was on my side that god was on my side that i was going to score a double century that time my confidence increased so now yes there can be times when we can pray to god and god can be on our side but the bhagavatam's mood the bhagavata's mood is not that god is on my side it is that i am on god's side it's not that i have my mission and god should help me in this but rather god has a mission in this world and i should help god in this world so you can say is the starting devotion that is sukritina what krishna says the initial people sukritina they want god is on my side they have that faith and that is good that is good at least they have that much faith that means they have their, they have that much devotion that they are praying to god but this is krishna talks about this in 716 but the key difference it takes bahunam janmana mante to understand that to actually become gyanavan and to be gyanavan means i am on god's side that god has a plan god has a purpose for the world and i should be an instrument in that so the idea that god can ask someone even for the sacrifice of their life is extraordinary but it is not extraordinary in terms of the glory glorious level of devotion that is talked about in the bhagavatam so the sacrifice of life is extremely difficult but for one who is devoted to the lord that person can do it easily now when love is expressed to sacrifice it is actually extremely inspiring mm. so <clears throat> with some devotees in america you know we are now trying to present krishna bhakti in terms of uh, of what is already there in people's mind so with one devotee i am working on doing a series of podcasts on on american history viewed through the lens of the bhagavad gita so i plan to do something indian history also viewed through the lens of the bhagavad gita later but the point is so uh, he said there was we were discussing so there was one american patriot who was fighting the american war of independence and he fought a war and he just he stood and fought till he was going to be slaughtered and he told all his friends just go away i, I will stop them and then his the, the, the british army was marching towards he says that he says, i regret that his, his commander told him i regret that i have to leave you here and this this um, patriotic soldier he said my only regret is that i have only one life to sacrifice for america now it's extraordinary level of sacrifice that when somebody is ready to sacrifice their life for the for any higher cause what to speak of the highest cause of the lord so it's it's a noble thing but there is something bigger than that that brings us to last part a sacrifice the sacrifice of life is great it is thrilling it is awe inspiring but actually the sacrifice of life is not as great as the life of sacrifice <laughs> <laughs> so now this particular anecdote is attributed to many leaders so it's apocryphal apocryphal means that it is history but it is going further so it is sometimes it's attributed to nehru it sometimes attributed to winston churchill sometimes attributed to george washington the idea is that uh, that some young man comes and says to these leaders 
that you know, I, I want to lay down my life for the country. And that leader tells them that, he says that more important than laying down your life for your country is to become a responsible citizen. There's a young person who says, study, get educated, take a responsible job, become a responsible citizen and contribute through your life to your country. And that is a greater sacrifice. Why? In one sense, of course, sacrifice of life is glorious. But it, it actually requires one moment of extraordinary courage. But a life of sacrifice requires continuous exertion. Continuously, we have to, life of sacrifice means, we have constantly, we have to put purpose above pleasure. Hmm? Put purpose above pleasure. That is not easy. What is the higher purpose? That the higher purpose is that that is what I'm going to serve. You know, I could be comfortable or I could I could work hard. So each time to choose, say hard work or comfort, that is not easy. So this devotee with whom I'm working, he says, you know, I'm a Hare Krishna devotee, but I'm an American patriot. So he's telling me that. Mm, that he says the miracle of America was not that America, that America began independence from UK. Because America had a very small army at that time. And the UK was an empire. But it's not that George Washington became the president. It is, he says, the miracle of America is that George Washington did not continue to be the president in the second term. He was the unilateral leader. But he said, no. He says, I want to, I want, Americans to take responsibility. So there was no coup, there was no violence, he voluntarily stepped down so that others could take leadership. He says, uh, if we contrast that with Dhritarashtra, you know, he had to be pushed out. You know, he had to be pushed out. He got the throne accidentally and then just because he was sitting on the throne for a long time, he thought I'm entitled to it. It became like that. So actually a life of sacrifice means if the purpose is to establish America as a great country, then my pleasure in being the president is not that important. So, for Srila Prabhupada, it was like that. Srila Prabhupada, in one sense, when he was in, in Vrindavan, he was living a relatively, a relatively comfortable and respectable life. Although Prabhupada was never a person who wanted a lot of comforts. He was an awesome, austere person, relatively speaking. But, in Vrindavan, he had a place, it was and more than physical comfort, it was spiritually extremely comfortable. But, Prabhupada, and not only comfortable, it was respectable. Prabhupada was not getting followers in India, but there were many people who were respecting. He was a sadhu and he was respected in India. But when Prabhupada went from India to America, no, he was putting com purpose above comfort. You know, he was going from a place to where he was respected, where his needs were facilitated, to a place where he didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't even know how, what kind of people was he going to meet, whether those people would be interested or not, whether he would even have enough vegetarian food to eat. He said that in those times, I said that the vegan movement, it started, uh, it started in, it depends on where it started, we can say, but it didn't start. The vegan movement was not there in the 1960s. There are several devotees who are trying to trace the history or rather establish the history how Srila Prabhupada was in many ways the pioneer of this vegan movement. Prabhupada didn't exactly teach veganism. He taught, what he taught was much more than vegetarianism. But what Prabhupada did was actually he brought a tangible culture. No. He's in the past, people thought, at least in America, to be a vegetarian means you have to just eat vegetables and live for the rest of your life. So, Hegri Prabhu writes that one of our greatest joys was that as big as was Swamiji's, he calls Prabhupada Swamiji, in that Hegri at the early before Prabhupada, Prabhupada came to be known as Prabhupada. He said one of our greatest, one of the most pleasant discoveries for us was that as vast was Swamiji's knowledge of Sanskrit verses, so vast was his knowledge of Vedic recipes also. <laughs> so he said, so many items could be cooked. 
and Prabhupada actually brought to the West the beauty, the extent of vegetarian cooking. But when Prabhupada went there, he didn't even know whether he would get vegetable, vegetarian food or not. So the point was, it's a big sacrifice, a huge sacrifice that Prabhupada had to accept. And he accepted that because for Prabhupada, comfort was not important, his purpose was important. Many of the Swamis and others who were living in Rindavan, it was common in Rindavan when a person becomes old, they come to Rindavan and they take Kshetra Sanyas. So I will never leave Rindavan, I leave my body in Rindavan. And his Swamiji was coming to Rindavan constantly going back, constantly going back. And one of, one of, one of the Matha leaders of their Rindavan, he says, you know, we used to think, why is Swamiji so attached? He's in Rindavan. What business does he have to go in a metropolitan city like Delhi and go here and go there? He says, little did we know that Swamiji's attachment was not material, that he had a mission. So, actually, Prabhupada could have sacrificed his life if he had wanted. You know, if it is live in Vrindavan, Prabhupada could have decided I will fast to death in Vrindavan. He would have ended his life, he would have gone back to Krishna. But Prabhupada chose a life of sacrifice. You know, going to the western world, dealing with people uh, who have no inkling of not only Vedic wisdom, but Vedic culture. There's so many difficulties. He took that because the life of sacrifice is actually far more demanding. It is far more demanding and it is also far more transformational. So that is, the sensational acts of courage are laudable when they occur. But what is more transformational for society is the non-sensational, the ordinary acts of commitment. So life of sacrifice is basically like a sensational acts of courage. Hmm? And if somebody is required to do that, definitely. If we are called upon, we should be ready to do that. But these are important, but this is more ordinary acts of commitment. You now every day when we have some responsible service, how do we take up that service? How do we do that? That is actually much more transformational. And that brings me to the last point, that the sacrifice we all can do right now. So, <clears throat> since I have been traveling uh, abroad, so I've had, um, I've learned a lot about my own limitations. And one of the things which struck me repeatedly and I, last time when I met His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj, I asked him about it. He said, Maharaj, uh, said, when I give classes, many devotees tell me that my classes are very intellectual. So, so one devotee told me that, you know, if you class, you hear your mind from your mind. So, but they, I told Maharaj, Maharaj, you know what, I, you know, it's not that I'm deliberately intellectual. <laughs> that is just the way I think and that is the way I present. It's very difficult for me to change. So, Maharaj said, you don't have to change yourself. He said that, you know, if Gaur Gopal Prabhu tries to be intellectual like you, it won't work. If you try to be humorous like Gaur Gopal Prabhu, it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I am concerned, he said, I am neither intellectual like you, nor humorous like Gaurgopal Prabhu. <laughs> then I said, Maharaj, whatever abilities we have, it is by your mercy. Maharaj, but Maharaj became grave. He says, but Krishna has gifted me with deep concern for others. And with that concern in my heart, whatever I speak, it seems to inspire others. So he says, you don't need to change yourself you just need to increase your concern for others. So, it was quite profound for me, but it was profoundly illuminating and profoundly confusing. It says, okay, it was a very important principle, but what does it mean? How do I increase my concern for others? So then, I talked with another um, senior Prabhupada disciple who is, very, who is very kind to me. So he said, Chaitanya Charan, you are cursed. I said, what do you mean, Prabhuji? 
<laughs> he said that you know you are too intellectual to be a religious preacher, and you are too religious to be an academic scholar. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, "You are like Trishanku." <laughs> that's why I said you are cursed. <laughs> so I said, "Prabhu, that's very helpful." <laughs> he started laughing. He said, "No." He said that you have to recognize that you will you will be always a better content generator than a content deliverer. That you will be able to generate good content, and there are others. who have more humor more charisma more ca capacity to attract others so he said you focus on the service you can do so at that time i started as hearing thing of both these things so when maharaj said increase your concern for others i said what does that mean so i started rehearing some of what i consider my best classes you know maybe 2013 2014 i gave the classes and i was surprised I may be alarmed that although it is my class, I had to pay full attention to understand what I was saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I had studied certain things at that time, and I was explaining things based on my inspiration, my understanding at that time. So then I realized. that i am actually making a lot of intellectual demands from my audience it is that you know, if i have to struggle to understand what i am saying saying then others will also not find it easy so so that is when i started using this tablet for writing <laughs> <laughs> so that you know try to increase your concern <laughs> <laughs> so even if what i speak is sometimes a little difficult to understand okay so devamrit maharaj told me that he said that your concepts are deep your vocabulary is high your speed is super fast <laughs> and your accent is heavy that's not a problem for indians but for western he says your accent is heavy he says even one of these is a obstacle he says when all four of these are there he says you should be surprised that anybody is understanding your class <laughs> <laughs> so in some way at least when i write my speed slows down <laughs> so so but overall the point i was making is that when i talked about i'm i was talking about sacrifice so for us what is the sacrifice that we can do see all of us there is even when we want to serve krishna Hmm? when we want to serve krishna there is the longing for a bigger role that i am a part of krishna's plan but if i could get a bigger role a bigger role could mean many things we might want some position by we could do some preaching we could mean we could, we want more people to follow us more people come for our programs more people to assist us in our projects we long for a bigger role and that's a understandable longing but more important this longing is there when we say that brahma bhuta prasannatma no shochati na kankshati so sometimes this kankshati the longing for a bigger role can actually become a distraction from our service you know if only i had more opportunities but rather than that the prabhupada was not longing for a bigger role many of the prabhupada disciples say that when the prabhupada was speaking to one person in a private darshan of prabhupada speaking to 100 people a thousand people prabhu is as enthusiastic speaking about krishna so instead of longing for a bigger role we can take responsibility to do our present role better so we can seek a long bigger role or we can seek to do our role better and this longing in one sense is natural when we see somebody who can sing better than us well as far as i am concerned everybody sings better than me so <laughs> so that is a project i have postponed for next lifetime <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway 
the point I was making is that when we see somebody who has some more ability than us, we may feel, you know, if only I had that much ability, I could do this service, I could do that, I could do that. We can all long for a bigger role, but the important thing is that we seek to do our role better. Our role better. What is the role that I have right now? What is the service I have? Can I do this service better? And that focusing on our present role, however small it might be, instead of longing for a bigger role, that is a single sacrifice that can actually be the biggest, the most tangibly transformational in our life. Because that longing for a bigger role can prevent us from tapping the opportunities we have right now. Whatever opportunities we have, we are speaking to one people, ten people, we are doing some back-end service, we are doing some front-end service, whatever it is. If we do our role better, we will be connecting with Krishna. We will be experiencing Krishna. We will be absorbed in Krishna. So, Radha Shampal in the morning was speaking about absorption in Japa. And one of the biggest reasons, at least in my experience, why we struggle with absorption is that we are not satisfied with our present role. You know, if only this will happen, that will happen. If you understand that I am meant to serve Krishna, Krishna, please engage me in your service. And whatever service is there, if I have prayerfully connected with Krishna through Japa, and during the day, naturally, I'll be able to do that service better. So, Prabhupada did not wait for the Gaudiya Mat to give him a position, to give him some assistance. Prabhupada did not wait for getting a bigger role. Prabhupada just kept doing his role, whatever he had. He kept doing it. Better. Better means, okay, he's right, speaking here, speaking there, speaking there, wherever it would work. So this is a practical sacrifice which we all can do. By which, whatever service I have, let me try to do it in one small way better. And that way, if we can do it one small way better, dadami buddhi yogam, Krishna will give us intelligence, how we can do it even better. And if we are doing our role better, then Krishna is watching, you know. If we do our present role, role better, Krishna will give us a bigger role later. <laughs> so, do our present role, what did it? Better. And what will happen? Krishna will give us a bigger role later. Now Krishna may or may not give it to us, but why would Krishna not give? If a devotee is earnestly serving Krishna, why would Krishna not give facilities to a devotee? Why would Krishna not give opportunities to a devotee? So the circumstances may be in a particular way, but it doesn't matter. Krishna is transcendent under circumstances. Krishna will give us that opportunity later. So this is the spirit of sacrifice that we all can take from this particular pastime of Dadichi Muni. So I'll quickly summarize what I discussed. First I talked about how the Lord works in the world. It is to, so directly, but that's rare, it's much more is indirectly through his intru instruments. And those instruments have to be ready to take that responsibility. The whole Gita was spoken so that it would inspire Arjuna to take up the responsibility. So Krishna wants us to do that. And then we talk about love is seen through two things, what we give and what we give up. And giving up is actually much more difficult than giving. Many people can give charity, but to actually make tangible lifestyle changes, like I talked about the story of the owner of the vegetarian uh, hotel chain in New Zealand, it's much more difficult. And to both give and give up, that is the most difficult. But that is the, also the sign of the greatest devotion to the Lord. Then the third point I talked about is a sacrifice of life. How that is rare, that is glorious, when somebody is ready to do that. That somebody is uh, called upon, whether it's, a, uh, whether it's a patriot doing it for a nation, whether it is a devotee doing it for the Lord. But in the Bhagavatam's vision, the sacrifice of life, it's almost like a side show. It's not a showstopper. Because in the Bhagavatam's vision, we don't demand God to be our protector. We simply see ourselves as the servant of the Lord. And whatever the Lord wants, we are ready to do that. So in that sense, Bhagavatam's vision of devotion is far higher than, say, what is described in other traditions. But then, greater than sacrifice of love is, sacrifice of life is a life of sacrifice. So this 
is more demanding because there's not a one-time extraordinary choice that will be glamorized by others, but it is a moment after moment choice of purpose over pleasure. I forgot to mention here, the example for this the life of sacrifice being more than sacrifice of life is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Sanatana Sanatan Goswami who wanted to end his life in front of the Rath cart. He said that your body is my property. I want to do great things through you. He said if by giving up my life I could attain love for Krishna, I would have given up my body hundreds of times. But he says that. So the life of sacrifice in our tradition is also glorious. That's the last part I discussed is we sacrifice, what sacrifice we can do is longing for a bigger role we can give up that longing and instead we can focus on focusing on doing our present role better and by doing this we will be more satisfied we will be contributing more even in a small way and krishna can give us a bigger role later thank you very much hare krishna He's asking you to sacrifice. Hare <laughs> 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 Krishna, thank you, Prabhuji. Uh, Prabhuji, sometimes uh, when we read or we, when we hear, so then we should apply it also in our life. So two things are there, knowledge and realization. So when we have knowledge, then we are told to do services for getting realizations. So apart from doing services, when someone has so much hunger for knowledge also, that while doing services, he has hunger that he is not peaceful, he wants to know more, he wants to read more. So what should he do? He should uh, continue only services or uh, means wait for the realization so he can continue services apart from getting knowledge also. Okay. Two things are there here. See generally we have for our spiritual growth, we, we have our swabhava. Hmm? That is our particular nature. And then there is the seva bhav. <laughs> Service attitude. <laughs> now, both are important. In fact, the seva bhav is required and then we serve according to swabhav. But in general, it is very difficult for us to very easily know what is our swabhav. Hmm? So, among the various services that are done, it's quite the service of preaching is quite glamorized. That's why everybody would like to study more and become a good preacher. And it's good to have that desire. But, you know, it is very difficult for us to know what is our sobhav initially. We have Rajoguna, Tamaguna within us. So, it's in the early stage of our spiritual life, it is good to focus more on seva bhav. Whatever service I am told to do, I do that. And whatever time I have, in that I can do what interests me. Uh, and that way, it's in one sense, we do the sacrifice. Mm. But over a period of time, see, if, if we just ask our mind, what is my sobhav? What is the service according to my sobhav? The mind will have one constant answer. The service you are doing right now, that is not according to your sobhav. <laughs> <laughs> We can't really rely on our minds. So just cultivate seva bhava. By that, we will come to sattva guna. We'll also become a little more clear. And then, as our guides, our senior devotees, they also see that in, we are serving steadily. Then they also want us to serve happily. So, if our sabhava becomes clearer, okay, this is what you know. This devotee is very suited for studying shastra, and that's what they get joy in. And then that's what they get pleasure in, that they actually can do tangible service over there and they will facilitate that. My question was not regarding uh, omitting services and doing reading. Services are okay, where we have to do services for getting realizations. Apart from doing services, that we are doing, that we are doing the services we are doing, but apart from that, we should wait for the realization or we can gain knowledge also and then simultaneously by services we can get realizations also. That was my question. 
do we wait for realizations in the sense that uh, someone has a, like normally well, we okay, read okay, regularly okay, I'll, I'll ask you a question i'm just thinking that see the very idea of realization is that it is something which is a gift we can get understanding but realization is a gift it is basically it's a complicated concept but realization basically means that which is a reality we experience it to be a reality we experience it and accept it to be a reality that means what we have heard in scripture we experience in daily life and we make the connection between the two of them so we we should keep studying keep serving keep sharing irrespective of whether we have realizations or not we don't have to wait for realization so that we can start start preaching but what we can do is we don't adopt a holier than thou attitude sorry holier than thou attitude that means not that you know i have conquered my senses and all of you conditioned souls i'll enlighten you how to control my senses <laughs> no these are some weapons i am also fighting this war and we are we are all fighting this war there are some weapons whenever i have used them they work for me so you can also try them out so if we have an attitude of humility you uh, humble service attitude then even if we don't have realization of particular subject we can still speak that okay thank you so i don't know how much time we have i don't want to go over time mukund anand prabhu we had hari krishna prabhu ji okay prabhu you as you yeah please uh, as you rightly mentioned that sacrifice of life is easier than a life of sacrifice no neither is easier <laughs> <laughs> I meant <laughs> Okay go ahead okay. I just wanted to make your life tougher <laughs> Yeah So life of uh, sacrifice so that constantly putting pleasure below purpose that becomes very difficult so some practical tips for that Well we should be ready to do that that doesn't mean we have to do it all the time that's why the idea of we over a period of time we serve according to our swabhava so we want to serve krishna but if there is, there are two services and we have the option to choose both among one among them then we can serve the choose the service which we are more comfortable doing which are more satisfied doing it is that we should be ready to sub- subordinate no it in terms of like uh, doing duty versus uh, like the sense gratification not in terms of so ab like sometimes we get, get carried i get carried away with sense gratification well Over. yukta ahara viharas you know everyone has to find out see basically uh, the sense gratification it is everybody needs to regulate it but each individual has to find out uh, when pandering to sense gratification is distracting them from bhakti from krishna and when denying themselves sense gratification is, is describing them of bhakti is distracting them from bhakti so that's why prabhu i think bhakti nathakur talks about this in bhakti aloka that what is specific word he says is regulated level of sense gratification something like that he says the, the idea is that somebody is fasting now fasting on ekadashi is good but if somebody is fasting they are chanting hari krishna hari krishna and the mind is chanting food 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 prasad 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 well and they just not able to silence the mind Well, better take some prasad and then chat, isn't it? So it doesn't have to be. There is sense gratification which is when it is in excess, it is going to be a distraction from the spiritual path. But now, with, as long as within the bonds of bonds boundaries of dharma, as long as it is, uh, yeah, it is primarily within the boundaries of dharma. The like dharma, artha, and then kama is also there. So one has to find out uh, that level which will n- ensure that. it is not a distraction the human life is too important to be spent in fulfilling our sensual desires but it is also too important to be spent in fighting our sensual desires human life is meant for something much more important that is for cultivating spiritual desires for cultivating love for krishna so yes for cultivating love for krishna we do have to fight sensual desires but we shouldn't be our mind mental energy should not be too caught in that fight and we are fighting for serving krishna so hope that answers the question okay thank you the last question behind yeah. uh prabhu ji i have this question first of all thanks for a brilliant class <laughs> attending through 
So this evolution of speaker that we spoke about, or evolution of a leader in Krishna consciousness, in general, of course, mm. this question is not to this place. What we happen is, you know, the followers or devotees, they dedicate their life based on the current paradigm of the speaker or the follow, you know, the leader. But we see that over the period of years, if the leader's paradigm changes, it becomes very difficult for the follower to readjust, reconcile with the changed paradigm. And at times it is within the boundary of Sampradaya, at times it is, you know, on the fringe side. So how to reconcile this? Adibhutam Sharo Bhava. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the material world keeps changing. So although devotees, are, the soul is transcendental, devotees are serving a transcendental purpose, but how that purpose manifests in the material world will vary. So, Tamal Krishna Maharaj writes in one place that he, he, was, he was attracted to Srila Prabhupada and he was attracted to book distribution and going out and preaching. And then, you know, that was what Prabhupada was encouraging in 1960s, early 1970s. And then Prabhupada's focus shifted. Prabhupada focused on India and he focused on, on temple construction. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj just he says, is going to this place and asking for this permission and doing this and doing that. That just didn't. He was well completely drained by that. He said, Prabhupada, I want to go to America and preach. Prabhupada said, you are preaching, you are building a temple. He says, no, Prabhupada. He, he almost, uh, you know, they had a negotiation. And Prabhupada said, okay, you can go. And then he went there. And in one sense, Prabhupada was not very happy with that. But, and Prabhupada after said, so you had done enough preaching, now come back to India. He said, no, but Prabhupada, <laughs> Prabhupada said, I said, but I'm preaching here. Preaching means results. And then Tamal Krishna Maha, you know, he had decided his Radha was bus party and he brought so many young people. You know, they all, Tamal Krishna was also very intelligent. He knew how to please Prabhupada. So he had all these young people dressed in saffron. They all came with a rose and offered it to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, okay, continue your preaching. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Prabhupada that he had been attracted to or he was primarily inspired by that Prabhupada, Prabhupada was still the same person, but that Prabhupada's focus changed. So then he, he decided that, you know, okay, that's not what I can do. That's not what inspires me. And Prabhupada accepted that. So I would say that while a devotee always has a mood of submission towards their spiritual leaders, but there is also within our tradition space for negotiation. It's not just instruction and obedience. It's also negotiation. We see that in the example of Narad Muni and Dhruva. Narad Muni, Narad Muni tells Dhruva that go back to the kingdom. He says. And Dhruva says, the words you say are true, but they don't work for me. And Narad Muni doesn't say, who do you think you are? You know, I have instructed Vyasdev, I have done this, I have done, you are a small five-year-old boy. He says, no, he appreciates his authenticity. And then and he gives him, gives him up something which he can do. So I would say that, we need to negotiate, we need to understand that each one of us has our own inspiration and especially as our leaders are evolving in their spiritual life, if we have been practicing, we are also evolving. And we may also find a particular area where we can contribute. So, I don't think there has to be a conflict. It doesn't have to be digital or like one or zero. We can find our space and we can serve Krishna within that space. Okay. So, thank you very much. You, you, okay. You want to make some comments? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Swami Maharaj, I, am, I don't have words to thank you for that. So, secondly, I was remembering, uh, you said about how the responsibility is for current service. So I remember the past time of Sam Maharaj that he was told to be here. So he accepted that my life is here. So he never thought of in future what I am going to do or like that. May not be. At least he accepted that. So thank you for that. So my question is, Prabhu, here the subject matter is going on of an expert doctor and a patient. So when it comes to Dadichi and Supreme Lord or his pure representative like Haridas Thakur and all, so they are expert doctors really. And they are with Krishna in ecstasy. Whereas our case is, we are simultaneously both and we are told to do both. That you be a doctor, but actually we are patients. 
Okay. So, the challenge here is that we take role of preacher more eagerly. At least I am talking about myself. So, how do we focus on this doing at one time? As Mukundanan Bhav is saying, that how do I get inspired to do whatever is told to me to put heart? Because what happens in such a big community, what is appreciated publicly becomes the the flow of this is what I have to do. So I will just do this and then later on I want to do that so that I will get the, something from some devotee or something like that. Okay. No? So, so, and that is also wonderful. That inspiration is there. So how do, I, how do uh, the community can be inspired to do whatever they are doing with full heart? Because it happens that I personally I am saying for myself okay. that yeah. I was thinking when I joined yes. Ashram, I was thinking this, this is what is important, you know. If I do book distribution or if I do youth preaching, if I do that this, you know, that's what is the best, that will please Vrindavan and Chandra and that is sure. Yes. There is no doubt. So, so I, how I, do I think I, I got your question. I got your question, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the question is that how can mm, the certain services which are glorified, which are prominent, we long to do that, but how can we continue doing? the service that we are doing wholeheartedly. So I'd like to differentiate between aspiring and hankering. See, aspiring is, we all have aspirations. When Prabhupada was in India, or Prabhupada was an unknown Swami in America, he was still aspiring, he said, there are temples, it's filled with people, and only time is separating us. So there's, in fact, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong in aspiring to do a bigger service, to have a bigger role. See, but hankering, the word that is used is, hankering means, see, aspiring is that I have this and I would like to have more. I'm happy with this, I'm grateful for this and I want more. But in aspiring, there is an overall attitude of positivity. Whereas, it's hankering is negative. But what I have, it's, it's, a, it's a worthless, it's just an exhaustion. It's just irritating. So that should never be done towards any, should be there towards any service as much as possible. Right? We, uh, we, of course we want to aspire to do more and more. Why should we not aspire? In one sense, uh, uh, service to Krishna, or devotion means we want to offer more and more to Krishna. So a devotee can and should have aspirations um, for serving Krishna more and more. But that aspiration should not lead to resentment towards our present service. Oh, this service I have to do and because of which I can't do that. No, do the service that we can and if we get opportunities, do some other service. Learn some more skills. Every devotee needs to take responsibility to become a, become a more valuable instrument for Krishna. Now, valuable instrument means it could be that one way we become valuable is we become versatile. That we learn more services. So in the time that I have, I, that I, might cry, I do this service, but in my spare time maybe I learn this. I correspond with these people, I, I learn this, I learn that. We try to learn more things and who knows, in future we might get that opportunity. So certainly we should have aspiration. Wholehearted service, we shouldn't have unrealistic expectations from ourselves. There are certain services which we may just uh, not find very inspiring. And we may do those, because that's what we are told to do. But it is important for us to, if we consider our, the various services that we are doing, various activities in general. See, there are activities which uh, give strength to us. Hmm? And there are activities that require strength for us. Hmm? It's like people. Some people, it's like people, it's some people, some people bring happiness wherever they go and some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> so, like some people being with them gives us joy, gives us strength, gives us energy. And being with some people, every moment is like we are walking on eggshells and we have to, every moment is enormous restraint and after that, it's relief and it's exhaustion. Now we will have both kinds of people in our life. But it is our responsibility to make sure that we have adequate people, adequate association of people who give us strength. And then we can, that can give us the 
resilience to face the people who require strength. Now we may grow through both. In fact, we may grow through the things which require people who require strength also by interacting with them. Same with services. There are services which some things which require strength. We'll do them, but it's it's a, it's something which is exhausting for us. And there are services which enliven us, which give us strength. So it is our responsibility to make sure that we have some time, some space for the services that give us strength. And then the services that require strength, we can do that. So we, should, we can't we unrealistically expect from ourselves that we always do the services that require strength from us. So that's how we can intelligently manage. We can take guidance from our senior devotees also and we need to intelligently manage that. So if there is a service that gives us strength and we like, we want to do that more, wonderful. We aspire to do that more. So here we can have aspiring for this, but and aspiring for this is good, but resenting this, that's not good. The service that requires strength, don't resent them. Try to do them. See that Krishna has some plan. I'll go through this also. And over a period of time, Krishna will guide us how best we can, we can contribute. Thank you very much. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki. Pai Gaur Pramanandi. Hare Krishna. So, Chanchan Prabhu. Uh, in the recent years, he produced one calendar. <coughs> it's a calendar where you have a date along with one Gita quote. It's a very profound quote. So when I was traveling in America, I saw one of the sannyasis. You know, he had on his table. Every day, you just move, correct? No? One, one. You know, you take out one, one uh, sheet. So that uh, Swami was telling that when I see these quotes, you know, that gives me food for thought for the whole day. <laughs> Just one, just like you saw him, what you give to Krishna, what you give up for Krishna. Or, you know, sacrificing life versus life of sacrifice. So, he is not a man who can do a play of words, but the words are very profound. Just this one statement of, you know, sacrificing life and life of sacrifice is so, so thought-provoking. So, he has written hundreds of articles like that. I don't know how many of you are aware. He has a Gita daily app. How many of you know that? Of the North, yeah. So it's very easy to access his Gita daily articles. You just click it. Then you can, almost every day he writes an article on Gita. I thought totally there must be 700 articles. So I came to know recently he has more than 3,000 articles. Right? Is it? 4,000, huh? It's gone to 4,000 now. So, uh, which means each of this, for the same shloka, he has multiple articles now. I am currently going through his... Uh, Chapter 1, Chapter 2, I am in Chapter 2 now. But I am going to go through all the 700 verses. Very beautiful. So, he is blessed with uh, very profound wisdom. He is again giving one more uh, class on Sunday, right? Here. Yes. Here he is giving on Sunday and uh, <clears throat> we are sending him back and forth, Kunjibari and here. Huh? So, he is coming here. So, let us thank Chachan Charan Prabhupada. Haribo! Haribo!